Okay, so today we're going to start chapter eight. We're going to continue chapter eight all week. And in chapter eight, we're going to study sampling distributions. And like I mentioned today, we're going to focus on numerical data. So for a sampling distribution, I want you to think about if we don't know that the random variable follows a normal probability model, like we, what we were studying last week. Okay? And we want to learn about the random variable. And so we do this by looking at a sample. We wouldn't just look at one sample, we would look at multiple samples. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the distribution of all distinct samples of size n from our population. <clears throat> so that's what we're going to do today. So let's get a couple definitions down um, and understand what the sampling distribution is and what it's about. And then we can take a look at an example. So I want, want you to know that a statistic is a random variable. because the value changes from sample to sample. <clears throat> Therefore, X bar, our sample mean, has a probability distribution associated with it. So right there. So we're studying numerical data and specific, we're studying the sample mean X bar. X bar is a statistic. Remember a statistic is just something from our sample. So X bar is a statistic. And since X bar changes from sample to sample, right? My mean changes. So say we're studying um, <clears throat> the grades from exam one and I take a sample of five students over and over and over again from our class, right? My sample mean right, the average of all those exam one scores will change right? from sample to sample. So my X bar, um, since it is a random variable, it does have a probability distribution associated with it. And we're going to study this distribution, which is the sampling distribution of X bar. So my sampling distribution of the sample mean. That's what we're going to study today. <clears throat> so when we're looking at this, we're looking at X bar and X bar is the random variable here that we're going to study. X bar does have a probability distribution. associated with it. And the idea here is to find all distinct random samples of size n and compute the sample mean, which is X bar, then look at the distribution.
of those means. So when we're looking at the distribution, similar to last class, um, <clears throat> but last class we're looking at individual data values, right? This class we're looking at means. Okay. So similar to last class, we still want our data set to be normally distributed, bell-shaped, symmetric, right? And I have a new way to introduce to you how we can tell if the sampling distribution is symmetric, shaped, bell-shaped, any of those, normally distributed. I normally just say normal, you know, normally distributed, normality, that kind of thing. And this is called the central limit theorem. It looks worse than when I write it all out than it actually is. Um, oh, thanks. Thank you. Someone's answering for me in the chat. I appreciate that. <laughs> the central limit theorem. So the central limit theorem looks long. It looks like a lot to it, but then I want you to realize it's really actually a quick, short visual kind of thing. So what the central limit theorem says is that regardless of the shape of the population, the sampling distribution of X bar becomes approximately normal. So that's what I'm talking about, symmetric. As the sample size, which is my N, increases. And what we use here in our class <clears throat> we use n is greater than or equal to 30 as a large enough sample size to assume normal. So what I'm saying here is it's a quick visual, meaning I just look at, sorry, you can see all that. Um, what I'm saying here is it's just this quick visual where you're going to look at your sample size N, right? So you'll read this out of the problem. And if N is greater than or equal to 30, then we can go ahead and assume that it's symmetric. It's normally distributed. It does not matter the shape of the population. So the population could be skewed right, skewed left, symmetric. It doesn't matter, even uniform. Uh, a uniform just means it's like a big rectangle. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't matter, but my sampling distribution will be symmetric as long as my sample size is large enough. That's the central limit theorem. So that's what I'm saying. This looks a lot worse. All you're going to look to see is n greater than or equal to 30. Now, if n is not greater than or equal to 30, then it doesn't mean it's not normal. And that doesn't mean it's not symmetric. It just means I can't use this way to say that it is symmetric, okay? So if you remember back, um, I don't know, I think it was chapter three, when we started talking about um, a distribution, we started looking at three different things and that was the shape, the center, and the spread. And we're going to continue with that idea. So let's look at describing the distribution. Let's describe the sampling distribution of X bar. That's my sample means. I'm just go, I don't normally write it all out, both of them, but I want you to realize it's all the same thing if I say X bar, if I just say sample mean here. So the first thing we're going to look at is the shape. 
So I want to be able to say that it's normally distributed. And the reason why I want to say this, is because I want to calculate probabilities or percentiles like we have been doing all last week on this. And all we know right now is a normal shape, right? So I want to be able to say that it's normal, but I need to prove it. I can't just say, well, it's normal. I don't know that. I have to prove that it's normal. So I have three different ways in this chapter that I can tell. The first way, and this is the way I always use first, is if n is greater than or equal to 30. It doesn't matter if we're here in stat one or if we're in stat two. I always use the central limit theorem first. If my sample size is large enough, then we can go ahead and assume that our sampling distribution is symmetric. Um, it's like the easy way out, right? This is like an easy check. So I always like to check that one first. Then my second way is something that we only will have here in chapter eight because chapter eight is the only chapter where we actually know about the population. And that is if we are told that the population is normal. So if the population is normal, then it doesn't matter the sample size, the sampling distribution will also be normal. So again, and I'm just gonna make a note of this, I'm going, going to say only in chapter eight. And the reason why I'm going to mention this is because we're, we're going to continue with all this throughout the next couple of chapters. And this is this only can take place in chapter eight. And the reason for that is, is what we were talking about right in the beginning of, of class today, that we're kind of working our way a little bit backwards. We have a little bit of like an upside down world here in chapter eight, where we actually know information about our population. Like that's really unrealistic. And then we're figuring out what's going on with these samples, right? So we're kind of working backwards. So we could be told that the population is normal because we know about the population in this chapter only, okay? Then um, we can use something that we used last week that we were introduced. And that is if the NPP, and I will write it out just in case any of us forgot, that's my normal probability plot. is linear. So remember, and I was reading through the team assignments, remember all you need for this one is for your, it's a visual. You get this NPP, if it's fairly linear, then you can go ahead and say, yes, that my distribution is uh, symmetric, it's normal, okay? So we have three different ways. I want you to know these are all ors. So it's not all three have to take place, it's one, or the other, or the third, okay? It's just, you need one of these to be true, not all three. And just because, and I, I'm saying this multiple times because this is what happens, N is 16 and then someone says, oh, it's not normal because N is less than 30. No, it's not that. It just means I can't prove normality using my central limit theorem. It just means I have to use one of these other two ways, okay? Let me just make a note here. The NPP, the normal probability plot is linear. You need to have raw data. So must have raw data. So, or given the plot, right? But we can't just come up with that plot without the data values. We actually have to have those data values. Okay. So the next thing we want to address when we're looking at describing the distribution of our sample means is, uh, first of all, it's my shape, then it's my center. So remember what we were doing last week, we said we had the center and spread of our distribution, right? We knew where the middle of the distribution was, and then we knew how spread out our data values were because we had that spread. And for last week, it was the mean and standard deviation. And I mentioned that, I said, well, for this week, it's the mean and standard deviation. And it's going to change as we move on. And we're going to see some of these changes here. So our center of our sampling distribution for our sample means is going to be the mean of all the means. So it's going to be the average of all my X bars. So I'm going to show you some notation. I'm going to tell you what that value is. So it's the mean of all these X bars.
So it's the mean of the sample means. So it's my average of all of those X bars. So maybe I'm going to get a um, thousand X bars from my data set, then I'm going to take the average of all of those X bars. The average of the averages, okay? We're not actually going to do this, you guys. We're not actually going to find all distinct samples. What we're doing is we're picturing, we're imagining what's going on based on our population. In the mean of all the X bars from our sampling distribution should come right down to the population mean. And remember, we know the population mean because we have information about our popula population, which, like I said, is unrealistic. <clears throat> and I want you to know that even with an outlier in the sample, the mean is still going to be fairly close uh, to the original mean here. Okay, so um, with larger samples, the effect of a single outlier will be smaller and smaller. Right. Um, but I just want you to, to keep that in mind. Even if we have some outliers and some of our samples, there probably is not going to be enough of them to throw this value off to say that the average of all the X bars is going to be population average. Okay, so that's why we can go ahead and say that. And then the third thing we want to look at is the spread of our curve. Remember, the spread is the variation. It's just saying how spread out are my values. And it's no longer just an individual data values. Now it's my X bars, it's my sample means. So I wanna know how spread out are my sample means from each other, okay? And here we're going to look at, and I'm gonna give you a couple different notations. Um, what it is, it's the standard error of X bar. And I'm going to write this all out so you know but it's my standard error of X bar. I always abbreviate this by the way. Sometimes for notes, I could like kind of write it out, but, or I'll say it, but I still just write out SE. Standard error of my X bars. All this is, this is just my standard deviation. So I'm going to write it my sigma of my X bars. Remember what standard deviation is. Standard deviation is that average distance from the center. But so what we're looking at is not just individual data values now, we're looking at these X bars and how far they are from the mean, right? So this calculation is actually a fairly simple calculation. And it's just going to be my sigma divided by the square root of n. So we'll just keep in mind that sigma here is my population standard deviation. And n is just my sample size. So the only thing I really have to calculate here is this. Take the square root and divide. This right here for my center, I'm just pulling out my population mean, which will be given to me in my problem. And up here, I'm just going to have to show one of those three. So obviously, if I have, if I have to do an NPP, that's a little bit more work. But if, if you're just look, looking at N, you can use the central limit theorem. You could just write that out. If you're told, you can just write that out that you're told. So there's really not a lot of work to this, although it looks long, okay? And I want you to know, um, because this comes up actually a lot, I want you to think about this spread, okay? It's called the standard error of X bar. Sometimes we just say standard error. Um, I like to distinguish, and I like to say X bar to you guys because I want you to realize it's my standard error for my sample means specifically that we're studying right now. But I want you to take a look at this calculation. It's my standard deviation divided by the square root of N. It's divided by my sample size. What will happen to this overall number as my sample size increases? So you could think of this two ways. You could just think of it um, just what happens as you have a bigger sample size for your spread 
what should happen? Your, your spread should decrease, right? Because a bigger sample is always better. A bigger sample is always going to give you a better idea of what's going on. So your spread should be smaller. And look at this, if you just mathematically, and we're just looking at the calculation, N is in the denominator. If I have a larger N, I have a larger number in my denominator, what's going to happen to this overall number? It's going to become smaller. So I'm just going to make a note. As N increases or as N is larger, the spread or my standard error decreases. So I want you to think about that. You have two different ways of thinking about it, mathematically or just logically, what happens when you have a bigger sample, my spread will become smaller for my dis distribution. All right, so I'm gonna show you some notation like we looked at last class, and then we'll talk about an example. Oh, I didn't realize I have like 20 minutes, okay. <laughs> All right, let me get this kind of that here. Okay, so our notation here, I have some notation like we were talking about last class, class like where I say, well, the random variable follows a normal model, that kind of thing. So I have two different ways of showing this to you because there's kind of two different, I don't wanna say setups, but I'll, I'll show you. So, um, I'm going to say that when my data values, okay, so when X follows, that's my population, follows a normal probability model with the center at the mean, remember this is for my population, and my spread for my standard deviation, sigma, then X bar, so my sample means will follow a normal probability model with the center again at the mean and a spread now at the standard error. Okay. So this means that my sample means follow a normal probability model with a center equal to the population mean and the spread equal to the standard error. <clears throat> so this is just saying what I talked about here for my shape, if we're told the population is normal. So what I'm saying here is if my population is normal with a center of mean and the spread at standard deviation, then my sampling distribution follows normal as well, the center at the mean and the standard or the spread at my standard error. Then we have another scenario and that's when it's not normal right here. So here we have when X follows any probability model. So it does not have to be normal, it could be any probability model, just meaning it could be normal, it could be uh, skewed, it could be uniform, could be normal, with a center at the mean and a spread at standard deviation, then my X bar follows a normal probability model, again, with the center at the mean and the spread at the standard error, if N is greater than or equal to 30 or the NPP is linear, okay? So all this is saying is it's going over the shape, the number one. And it kind of, I don't wanna say just the shape, it kind of goes over all three of these, the shape, center, and spread, because it's telling you the center and the spread, right? Center and spread. It's just based on what's going on with the population. All right. That's just some notation. You know, you guys will see this, right? We saw this on last week um, in class and on the assignment, the team assignments, we saw this notation. We had to take this 
notation continue with a problem. Okay. So that's what we're looking at. So let's take a look at a quick example and work through that while we have the time. So an example today, oh, we're gonna look at the test scores from one of my pre-calc classes. So the population, now remember, this is what it's about, that we have information about the population. So the population mean test score, <clears throat> on the pre-calc, final exam is 75 with a standard deviation of nine. You guys, this is like a true story. <laughs> um, the pre-calc final is super hard. I teach pre-calc sometimes. I haven't taught it in a couple of semesters, but I teach pre-calc sometimes. It's like one of the hardest classes in the fact that it's so fast paced. There's so much material to pack into 14 weeks. It's, it's crazy. Like I cannot miss a class. I cannot be late to a class. The class has to run over. <laughs> I'm serious. It's like, I do not have enough time to get through the material. There's so much. And what happens is there's so much material and it's so strenuous for students that the final exam scores come out pretty low. So the average is 75 and my standard deviation, my spread is nine. Okay, it's pretty crazy. So this is what a problem is going to look like. I'm gonna give you information about a population and we're going to imagine what's going on with that sampling distribution, but you have to know what sample size you have. Okay, so it will say a random sample Remember, it's not just one random sample. You're going to take distinct random samples. You're not actually going to do it. You're imagining of 41 students is taken. Let's describe the sampling distribution. And let's find the probability that an X bar is greater than 79. That's pretty good considering if the average is 75. Okay, so to describe the distribution, we wanna look at the shape, center, and spread. So here we're going to look at the shape and I want to be able to say the shape is normal. That's always what I want to do. I always want to prove normality. I just have to explain why I can say normality. So you can't just say, oh, it's normal. You have to show me why, right? So I'm, I'm kind of asking myself the question, is it normal? I want to show why. So remember we had three different ways over here to look to see if a shape was normal. So if my sample size is greater than or equal to 30, it's going to be normally distributed. If the population is normal, then the sample will be normal. Or if we have raw data, we can check that NPP to see if it's fairly linear. I always check this first one here first. Uh, I kind of actually go in this order and I go that way. So here we can see our sample size is 41. 41 is clearly greater than or equal to 30, so that's it. So I'm just going to say n is greater than or equal to 30. And then I just say, yes, normal. So this is what I'm looking for you guys, from you guys. I want you to say yes or no if it's normal. And then um, how are you telling me it's normal? Because n is greater than or equal to 30. You can say 41 is greater than or equal to 30 if you would like. That means the same thing to me. Okay. Now the center of my distribution Remember, this is the mean of all the X bars, but we're not actually going to find all the X bars. We're just imagining what they're going to look like. So um, I'm just gonna write the notation. It's the mean of all the X bars here. And that is just equal to my population mean. So I can go back up to my problem that says the population mean on my final is 75. So the center is just 75. So I can already picture what this is going to look like. And I am going to draw it out here in a minute. When I, when I go to the second part to find probability. And then the spread. So the spread here, I have a little calculation to do. It's not anything too difficult. Here, I'm looking for that standard error of my X bar. Remember what this is. It's my standard deviation divided by the square root of N. 
Standard deviation said it was nine, somewhere's here, and the standard deviation of nine. So that's my numerator divided by the square root of 41. So when I do this, I find that my standard error is 1.4056. So the spread of my sampling distribution is 1.4. The spread of just my data values is nine, okay? 1.4 is the spread of my X bars, of all those sample means that I took of size 41, okay? Let's just kind of do a little drawing here. Here's my normal curve, because we said it's symmetric. The center is what we already said was 75, right? And there, I, I can mark more, I don't need to though. I want you to know, like when I say sketch a curve, this is what I mean, put the center on there. Now let's look at the second part here. So the second part said, find the probability that X bar is greater than 79. So first of all, greater than means to the right. And it says probability, right? P. So this means I'm calculating the probability. That means I'm going to use the normal CDF in my calculator. And I'm gonna take a look at the drawing so I know what to plug in. So if I'm looking at 75, 1.4 is my spread. So do you think 79 is close to 75? Or do you think 79 is fairly far? When you take into consideration your spread and it doesn't really matter on your drawings, it's just a sketch. 79 is kind of far from 75 when you're taking into consideration that your spread is 1.4. So I'm just gonna put 79 over here and we're calculating this area to the right. So I don't know, what is the probability that I'm going to choose a sample size of 41 students and their average on that final exam, the average of all 41 students will be greater than 79. That's what I'm studying. I'm not looking at individual people. I'm looking at a group of 41 and I wanna know what their average final exam scores. What is that probability that it's going to be greater than 79? That's what we're studying, okay? So here for my calculator, I'm going, and when I say show work, this is what I mean. Type out normal CDF and what you're going to plug in. That's what I mean when I say show work on your, on your um, assignments. So remember, you're going to type in here for a normal CDF, because I'm calculating probability, four values. Your lower bound, so I can get that right from my drawing, so that's 79. My upper bound. I know, and you know, the upper bound can at max be 100, but 100 doesn't mean anything to my calculator because it does not know context, and same with Minitab. So I'm going to use infinity or 10 to the power of 10. I'm just gonna write 10 to the power of 10, 10 to the power of 10, 10,000, something just really large compared to these numbers, okay? I would use it just infinity if I could, but my calculator doesn't have that. Then I'm going to use the center. Now you guys, I want you to realize all of this work we just did up here in the first part to describe the distribution, use it, right? We just did the work to find the center and the spread of my curve, use it. The center is 75 and the spread is 1.4059. And yes, I would keep it out that far. I wouldn't just round to 1.4, I would use a 0 0.59. It'll just make a slight difference in your answer. Okay. Remember, we're using the spread that goes with the curve. The curve is on the X bars, right? It's, it's saying each little line that makes up this distribution, each little piece is a sample of 41 students, not individual students. <clears throat> when I calculate this out and I plug this into my calculator or I can plug it into Minitab, it's going to come out as 0 0.002. Two, or I could say it's 0.22%. That's the area over here, really small. I knew it was going to be really small, 0.22%. I knew it was going to be really small because my spread is 1.4. That means that 79 was really far. Think back to the empirical rule. We only did one, two, three, four standard, or one, two, three standard uh, deviations away. And when we um, talked about two standard deviations away, we said, oh, it must be an outlier, it's unusual, right? <laughs> okay, they would only be three points above and three points below. So 79 is pretty far, okay? Let's see, we just have a, we have a question in the chat. 
So if we have to show that, even if we use mini tab, I'd like you to show me something. When I say show me work, I'd like to see something. And I want to tell you why. I love getting, giving partial credit. Say you do this problem on mini tab and you tell me the answer is point, um, I don't know, some different, something different. Like you say, oh, it's 0.75%. And that's all you give me. How can I possibly give you any partial credit? Like I have no idea what you plugged in. And that is the reasoning for this. So if you are using mini tab, you can kind of do a write up like you would for mini tab, like what you're doing in mini tab, but you, you're still using the normal CDF function and you're just telling me what you're plugging in. So you could, like if you're in mini tab, you could say, well, I'm using the um, probability density function, right? And um, for the normal, and you could tell me, oh, well, my lower bound is 79, my upper bound is um, infinity, and then my center and spread. Like you can list it, okay, if you're in mini tab. So you can kind of type it up different ways. I just like to see something like this. I like to see, um, what you're plugging in, what you're using, because I'm going to tell you right now, half the students are going to plug nine in here. They're going to use the population standard deviation. And then some students will use 100 here. I see it all the time. <clears throat> and so I'd like to see it because you may say, well, this is what I'm plugging in. You get the wrong answer. And then I can give you more partial credit, right? Uh, because you plugged actually the right things in and you pick them out, but something went wrong. Okay, that's the way I like to see some work in mini tab. Okay, for any of it. Okay, when you're doing this. Now, if you're using mini tab, um, remember what happens. Mini tab always gives you area to the left, right? So if you are, you can't do like this, like you can in the calculator. So if you're going to use mini tab, then your mini tab will give you. Um, the area here to the left. So it will give you 0.78 and you just have to subtract that from one. Okay. Maybe I'll walk through that real quick because I do have a couple minutes. I'm gonna pull up a mini tab screen maybe if I have one. Let me get one opened up here real quick. Then we can look at it. So if you're in mini tab and you wanna do this problem, So I go to calc, probability distributions, and to normal. So it's the same place we, always, we went all last week. And you click on here. Remember, you still want to keep it to the cumulative probability function. When you're calculating probability. Your mean is your center. So in this case, it was the 75. Your standard deviation is your standard error. So in this case, is 1.4. 059. I'm not going to use an input column. I just want to put one value in, and that's the value of interest, which was the 79. And then when I click OK, I get this value, right? So I get this value that's um, the area to the left. And so what I need to do is I need to get the area to the right, okay? So I'm going to just take this value and subtract it from one, and I will get that 0 0.0022, okay? Or that 99.78%, right? As, uh, as the area on the left, and then the 0.22% on the right. So you can look at it either way, as a decimal or a percentage, but you're still going to take this value and subtract it from one to get the area on the right. 